Well, even for uh, at, at a most basic, simple level, the workhouse did have significance for um, many sections of the town's society. The property owners, well, they had an interest in it because they paid the, res the rates that kept it going. Um, they had an interest in ensuring that their rates, their money wasn't being wasted. So they avidly read accounts of what was going on in the workhouse. They read the newspaper reports of how the boards of guardians were using their money. Um, and they rate pairs of visibility for exactly how that, that money was being used. And they were able to vote in the elections to see who would be on the next board of guardians. So there was a real interest there. For the town's tradesmen as well, the workhouse was surely important. From the outset, the existence of the workhouse provided employment for the builders and the skilled labourers who won the initial contract to actually put it up. Once the building was fully operational, it had to be supplied on a regular basis with large quantities of food and other essentials. Just to give one example, September 1890, the Guardians put out a tender for massive amounts of things, but one particular tender that they put out for listed the following bread and tea, beef, salt, Indian meal, bran, pepper, matches, candles and washing and soda, white soap, brown soap and black soap, sherry, porter and brandy, very important, mold skin, straw, glazing, nails, printing and last but not least, coffins. So that's an idea of the sorts of things that needed to be provided on a monthly basis to the workhouse. Orders for food and provisions were made on a, a regular basis and for very, very large amounts. Hundreds of pounds of bread and meal, for example, were consumed weekly. It was therefore much in the interest of a local supplier to win the contract. The workhouse was also very important for the town's ambitious uh, and socially active middle classes. Being elected as a guardian was a very important statement of your status in society. And it also represented the only political outlet for many of Ireland's middle classes throughout much of the 19th century. It was an elected position, and the poor law actually gained an awful lot of responsibility outside the relief of the poor as the 19th century went on. It actually was the forerunner to what we now know as local county councils, etc. So it was a very important position for those who had any political pretensions whatsoever. Now, while a third of the guardians were appointed, two thirds, as I say, were elected from the local ratepayers. You can be elected guardian if you owned property valued at anywhere between six pounds and thirty pounds a year, depending on the available value of the district. And you could vote for the guardians if you owned property valued at four pounds or over. So, as I say, it did give everybody a certain degree of access to elected political responsibility. So. What's interesting about Bell Money in particular, however, and what actually made it really different from many other parallel unions, is the extent to which the elected guardians and the town's middle classes dominated over the traditional landed guardians from an early stage. Again, this is sort of a reflection of Bell Money's particular characteristics, a very strong tradition at that stage of liberal radical politics. Um, this liberal outlook was reflected in the fact that the chairman, the vice chairman and the deputy vice chairman were actually tradesmen rather than your traditional uh, lord or earl or duke or whatever. But the liberal outlook was also reflected in another interesting thing about Balamani, and it really stands out here, and that's the fact that it was one of the very first unions of Ireland to actually elect women as guardians. The admission of women to poor law administration was made possible through an act passed in 1896. But Northern Unions in particular were very slow to see women represented on the boards of guardians. Many unions didn't elect women to parallel boards until the early 1920s. Cookstown appointed its first and last in 1939, while Enna Skillen, the bastion of the rural conservative tradition, never had any women in its entire history as a parallel union. In contrast, Balamani was one of the first unions to elect women as guardians. There were three elected to the boards in 1890, and this tradition would continue right through to the end of the Poor Law Union in Ireland, to the extent that by the time the Board of Guardians were wound up, Balamon Union had had a total of 53 women guardians. The minute books show that in April 19, 1899, three women were present for the first time, Miss Douglas, Miss Hamilton and Miss Robinson. And from the outset, they took a very active role in much of the business of the board and were much more conscientious, I have to say, in attendance than many of their male colleagues. 
At their first meeting of guardians, these women, along with six men, were immediately appointed onto the House Committee, which had responsibility for ensuring that the workhouse was run efficiently and that a certain standard was maintained in issues such as bedding, clothing, diet, etc. One of the first things they did was to meet to consider changes to the diet of children, following which they recommended several significant and very important improvements. In July of that year, the ladies were requested to inspect the matron's quarters and they prepared a report on what needed attention. Their inspection was thorough and comprehensive and the report demanded that significant improvements needed to be made to the decor and the furniture of the room. In addition, they demanded that the following be purchased immediately. A hearth rug, coal box, half a dinner set, half a tea set, curtains and bowl, tablecloths, cutlery, saucepans and a kettle, a full bedroom suite of furniture, a bedstead, a mattress, a feather pillow, a mirror, a toilet seat, a hearth rug, a fender, a washstand and chairs. You can see the women's touch already. But finally, and perhaps more importantly as I say, if we're going to really get into a local area, who were the people who sought relief in the workhouse? Who were they? Where did they come from? Why did they need the workhouse? And most of the information regarding this comes from the indoor registers, which we have some examples of over here. And actually the ones that are there are the very ones that I did most of my research in. Now these still exist almost intact for the whole period, uh, for Balamoney in particular. Uh, and they tell us so much about the people being admitted to the workhouse. You can trace individuals as they come in and out of the workhouse. They tell us a lot about it. That's just um, one of the things I did was to enter all this information into massive databases. And this is just a small extract from a database. So you get, for example, the surname, the forename, the age, the gender, the religion, the occupation, the address, their condition when they entered the workhouse, the state of health, the date in which they were admitted and the date in which they were discharged. So you see already how you can begin to use this information to build up pictures of how people use the workhouse. And what's important about this is this section in society is so often the hardest one to get at. For any historical researcher, it's the poor that are very, very difficult to trace because so often they haven't left a record of their doings or their thoughts or their feelings. So, I could be here all night talking about what I found when I started analysing the information in the indoor register, but what I thought I'd do is just look at some of the aspects uh, that struck me as particularly interesting, particularly in the light of the very, very bad press that the workhouse has in Irish history. One of the things that struck me as being of real interest was the way in which the workhouse was actually used, particularly in the latter half of the 19th century, as a place of casual accommodation. I looked at the numbers admitted to Balmoney Workhouse and the numbers admitted to Bally Castle Workhouse in 1861 through to 1911. Now, Bally Castle's the blue line, ignore it because it's not very interesting. But Bally Castle is interesting, sorry, Balmoney is interesting, it's the red line. Now, you would expect, okay, the years just following the famine, you would expect a lot of people to be in the workhouse. But by the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century, you would expect that the numbers being admitted every year would actually drop. But as you can see here, they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I find that very, very surprising indeed. Why were so many people being admitted to the workhouse? Now, when I examined them more closely, um, a picture began to emerge that actually explained the numbers. And it showed that it was because they were using it in a different way. In 1851, in the years just after the famine, we see a profile of the people in the workhouse, which is the profile that people expected to see. It was really the people it was intended for. We had the old and infirm in the workhouse, people who were no longer able to care for themselves. <coughs> there were mainly women, maybe women whose husbands had died, who were now widowed or who had no other means of support. There were families admitted, lots of, of women and children, perhaps a husband had deserted or maybe again had passed away, and they were now destitute, having no source of income. And most importantly, once they were in the workhouse, they tended to stay for quite significant lengths of time, and sometimes they stayed in for good. But when we turn to 1911, we see a completely different profile. The people that were using the workhouse, that were being admitted to the workhouse, was massively swollen by a totally different group of people. They were young and able. Most of them had occupations. They were mainly men. They were mainly single. 
and most importantly, they were mainly staying in for one night. So it's a completely different type of person. They're using the workhouse in a completely different way. I think this slide sums that up most uh, significantly. This shows the length of stay. The first slide shows the length of stay in uh, 19, or sorry, 1861. The second in 1901. The red wedge is the really significant one. That's the red is the people who stayed for one or two nights. You can see in the earlier period, practically nobody stayed that short. Most people stayed for months, some even for years. Whereas by 1911, you can see the vast majority of people are in for one or two nights. So they often, when you look at these people, they were registered as being en route to another destination, generally a port. And they were normally skilled labourers or tradesmen who, whose trade was actually registered in the, in the registers. We had, for example, in Balamani uh, in 1879, with seven plasterers, 27 masons, 38 tailors, 24 printers, 10 sailors, a fiddler and a ballad singer. <laughs> One person, believe it or not, actually gave his occupation as pickpocket and his destination was in Belfast in search of work. <laughs> now, the destinations included Londonderry, Belfast, Coleraine, Dublin and Cork. So that's where they were going, that's where they were heading. And as you can see, there are mainly ports, so perhaps that was also facilitating immigration. Others, however, lived roughly in the district and were coming back into the workhouse over and over again. This character, for example, Joseph Chestnut, and this is just a snapshot from, from one short period, but we can see here how many times he came back to the workhouse. Um, his age varied, sometimes it was 55, sometimes it was 60, depending on how he felt really. He was married, he was a labourer, and he only ever stayed one night at a time, but obviously the workhouse for him was somewhere that he could come if he needed a bit of shelter and a bit of food. Others would stay in the workhouse for long periods of time, uh, discharge themselves and then come back again at another stage. Now this caused real problems for the Board of Guardians. It was completely and fundamentally in opposition to what the poor law was supposed to be. Indeed, so great was the extent of this type of use that Bella Mully's guardians devoted a significant amount of time to debating the problem. Um, the question was first raised in a meeting in October 1877 when uh, Mr Boyd noted that Coleraine Board of Guardians, and they always looked over their shoulder to see what Coleraine was doing, Coleraine Board of Guardians apparently had passed a resolution authorising the relieving officer to hand over to the police anybody presenting themselves at the workhouse more than once. Now, there was a stiff debate following. Uh, Boyd, he, he held that the poor house, I quote, was never intended to be a lodging house for tramps. But the chairman of the Board of Guardians, David Wilson, took a different approach, and I quote from him, he said, Poverty must be relieved. Happily, that is the law of the land. I do not see what else the poor house is for. Many of the tramps are honest tradesmen who can't get employment. They are obliged to seek relief, and I do not see why they should be refused. And sadly, on this occasion, all other stronger voices argued these people were getting supper, bed and breakfast at the ratepayers' expense, and that the increasing number was becoming a major issue. In April 1879, when it was reported that a total of 54 night lodgers had been admitted in one week, Wilson again found himself up against the majority of guardians. We were now proposing to give everybody a cold bath on admission. <laughs> it was also proposed that they should be made to give three hours notice before they leave in the morning so that they could at least get three hours work out of them. Now, Wilson objected that this constituted a punishment and nobody should be punished for being poor, basically. And he actually, it was reported in the newspaper, he turned to the name, just imagine looking over his glasses and saying, not one of you on this board, I quote, would like to take a bath in such weather as this. However, he was overruled and the bath became mandatory for a while. Now, in May 1880, it was remarked that, and I quote again, the bath does not seem to be having an effect. <laughs> and apparently Coleraine was now making them break stones. In reply, the clerk commented that they'd already tried this in Bellamoney, but there were more hammer shafts broken than stones. 